Thank you very much for inviting me to your, your group today. It's nice to see there's at least one lady here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here. The call the oh, um, but, uh, no, this is my um, talk, Tracing Relatives from the Belfast Shipyards. So I'm the Vice Chair of the Belfast Titanic Society and um, over the years we've had inquiries come to us about uh, people looking to trace their shipyard relatives, mainly these have been people from Canada, America, uh, far afield, who, who want to know, did their great-grandfather work on Titanic? That's the usual one. And it was during the pandemic time, whenever um, the people have more time, were at home, that there was a big surge in genealogical requests coming to the society. I'm also a member of the North of Ireland Family History Society. My local branch is Killyleigh, I live near Downpatrick. And um, even within that group, there have been a lot of inquiries looking to learn more about the shipyard relatives. So I decided to put together a talk um, based on my own personal research that I've been able to trace at least six of um, my close relatives that have worked in the Belfast shipyards. Now, the first thing to start off with saying that were more than Workman, Clark and Harnham of shipyards, we, uh, going back um, to the late 1700s, we've got the William Ritchie shipyard and there's remnants of the, the, the docks over on the County Antrim side of the river. But I am just focusing on these two main shipyards because they're the ones that um, probably for 150 or 70 years are the ones that people would be wanting to know more about regarding their relatives. So. Where are we? Do Harland and Wolf actually have employee reg uh, records? Due to the fact that at its peak, the Belfast um, Harland and Wolf uh, shipyard had a roughly 32 to 35,000 employees. And then when you take into account um, there are other um, shipyards that were in Southampton, London, um, the Clyde, even Liverpool, it was decided, look, you know, that totaled 65,000 at one point. So how do you keep all those records? And in fact, it was um, William Perry, Lord Perry, who decided um, early 1903 um, in January, so maybe this was a New Year's resolution, we'll get, have a big massive clear out. And what it, um, he issued a letter that said all correspondence letters and letters over, um, and letter books over seven years old were to be destroyed. And um, all the um, time records so from the time office were to be got rid of. But what wasn't to be destroyed was ledgers, journals, invoices, and staff wages books. Now, the staff wages, they would have been the ones that worked in the drawing offices, the head foreman, the head electrician. So it was all those that were deemed more important than the, the humble uh, laborers, uh, shipwrights, caulkers, etc. So sadly, they did a big um, sanitization of all of those records, and there's very few, therefore, that now exist. But working here and there, I've been able to uh, get some details for people um, about their uh, ancestors. Also, in the Second World War, whenever the Blitz happened, uh, our raids did destroy um, part of the main headquarters building, which meant a lot of records were destroyed then. Uh, not only either from the, the bombings, but the fires that occurred and then trying to put out the, um, so the water ingress would have been a big problem then for any records that were kept. Then moving on to 1989, whenever the, the former headquarter building was being um, taken, stripped of all the um, belongings and moved then to where they are now within the actual headquarters. Um, there were lots of ledgers we just found scattered on the floor. Some of them were able to be retrieved by those who could see the value and the worth of retrieving documentation, but many of them were just thrown out in the skips. And I've spoken to some former shipyard workers uh, who actually went along past skips as they were going home and lifted out bundles of things. So it was total disregard for the history of um, the, the Harland and Wolf in, in doing that act, so it's absolutely yes. awful. This, as you know, has now been converted into um, what is the Titanic Hotel. So, approaching um, Harland and Wolf, do you have any records that we could use for people who are inquiring and for genealogical purposes? And at the bottom, their statement was categorical in saying we regard all manner of personnel records and related material 
a strictly <coughs> confidential, and it is our strict company policy, policy to refuse access for general research purposes. So it was an absolute no. I, they came back and they said, um, because of maybe ongoing litigation claims, so if anyone had developed mesothelioma as a result of being exposed to asbestos, <coughs> so um, they, they said they were all confidential. Um, and what they do have, um, I was able to ask them, well look, I don't want to know about anybody in particular, but can you actually tell me what you hold? So that maybe in the future there may be a change of mind. So they came back and told me that they have apprenticeship ledgers from 1884, um, uh, Harland and Wolf was set up in 1861. Um, they do have earlier ones with the names and trades, whereas apprenticeship ledgers also included their address and the father's name and um, what trade they were going into. They've also got computer records um, for national insurance numbers for those who were employed from the uh, 1950s and early 1960s. They've got record uh, cards for people um, that were employed in the shipyard from 1960 onwards. They've got um, other uh, personnel cards uh, relating to electricians. And then from 1975 onwards, they've held all the personnel records. So any of you who've worked in, ship, in the shipyard there will have your a file held by them. So it's disappointing that um, you know they won't allow us even to do the, the hundred year rule where we could ask for records for those who have uh, <coughs> you know obviously died a uh, hundred years ago. But uh, no, there's no shift in them, and I've made a couple of inquiries. Um, since whenever they were retaken over um, in 19, uh, 2019. <coughs> so, shipyard occupations, absolutely, I think I counted at one stage about 80 separate occupations from the 1860s right up to the present day. Some of them are <coughs> very specific um, to shipyard occupations, um, you, you know, the likes of the ship, shipwrights and the um, where else would we have the, the riveters, moulders, would be definitely more likely to be a shipyard occupation. Pro approximately 40% of the shipyard, um, if we go back say 100 years, were labourers. That was one of the most common um, occupations. Now the thing is, whenever you come um, to look at the 1901 and 1911 censuses um, and it lists labourer, you would have no way of knowing where they actually worked because they could have been in any other business, Mackey's and um, Gallagher's, who knows, but if you have a specific shipyard occupation then it is going to be um, uh, easier to find out where they worked. The problem is we cannot say if they worked in Harland and Wolf or if they worked in Workman Clark and um, that's the, the, di the difference. Uh, occasionally I have found Queen's Island, which was another name for Hound and Wolf, mentioned in the censuses, and then you will definitely know occasionally again Workman Clark. But in 1901 and um, 1911, there were just the two shipyards. So my own family connection then, um, this is a photo uh, of a group of um, joiners. Um, my grandfather, he was born in 1884 and uh, joined the shipyard uh, roughly when he was 14 years old. He also did work in Workman Clark. My, my mother, she was 96, she died there just before Christmas. Her brother, who is 100, and he's very proud to say he's 101 on the 12th of July. And yeah, great birthday. Um, they both uh, remember their father talking about uh, having worked in Workman Clark now. What I have discovered from doing research for other people, they may have um, gone for a period of time to work uh, the, in the County Antrim side where Workman Clark originally started, um, but the majority of the shipyard men came from East Belfast. Um, Workman Clark was set up in 1879 on the County Antrim side of the river by actually two um, young men, Frank Workman and George Clark, who had done their premium apprenticeship at Harland and Wolfe and a uh, bit cheeky, they left their shipyard and uh, went over to the uh, County Antrim side and uh, set up their yard. When McElwain and Lewis, or McElwain and McCall, um, their shipyard ceased in 1894 and they were positioned right beside Harland and Wolf and uh, Workman Clark took over their premises and that became their south yard. The County Antrim side was the north yard. So whether my grandfather worked in the South Yard where uh, the Victoria Works would be and the Titanic Paint Studio, 
is um, where they filmed Game of Thrones, is the location of the Workman Clark South Yard. They went out of business in 1935 and Harold and Wolf um, absorbed the uh, South Yard into their own premises. Now, uh, this is a photograph I have no uh, date on it. I don't know who the other men are, and I keep showing it to different groups in the hope that someone will say, yay, that's my grandfather, great-grandfather there. Um, I, I don't know. So my, my grandfather's uh, seated on the uh, front row, second left, holding a pipe. These are the tools that we still have in our family. And uh, recently, um, Titanic Belfast, the exhibition centre, had been closed for two months and did an upgrade of their last four galleries. I was telling Johnny before I came in here, and they've actually acquired 19 artefacts. They refused to um, have anything on show uh, that's been retrieved from Titanic's wreck site, but they do have 19 other um, Titanic artefacts um, that they've now acquired for a five-year loan, so it definitely would be worth a visit to go back. And I also did a bit of filming for them. They've got a video in the last gallery in which I have brought along um, some of my grandfather's tools um, to show. Each of the men's names were engraved on the handle, so it meant that if they were lost or stolen, they could be returned to their rightful owner as um, the, the joiners, carpenters, they had to um, buy their own. Uh, tools, which was an expensive outlay for a family. Um, then how did I find out more about his occupation? So I got my uh, grandfather's marriage certificate and he is uh, shown as a joiner. And his father was a sea captain, but I'll go on later to explain that he actually worked in Horned and Wolf for a while. And so I've got the birth um, as well and uh, his death and a, a joiner. But a joiner could have been anywhere, and only for the fact that you probably have family stories telling you um, if you've had shipyard relatives that they worked in the shipyard. It was um, good when the years of depression um, occurred. My grandfather had to go away for a short while over to England to do work, and uh, having joinery skills was beneficial. My other grandfather that I've come to was a shipwright, and he couldn't, so um, it was quite hard for those men whose uh, skills weren't transferred preferable to during the uh, periods of the depression years. So my Gilpin family then, looking at the 1901 and 1911 censuses, and these are available free online, I discovered um, that in the 1901 census my grandfather then was listed as an apprentice carpenter and his brother Robert was a ship joiner. I am assuming that was also in the shipyard. It, doesn't specify, but um, it was quite often um, handed down through the family. So if you're, if the father was um, a joiner, he would be able to bring along his sons, his nephews, to try and um, come along and have um, and work in the shipyard. So it wasn't uncommon for whole families of, of men to actually be working in the shipyards. Um, in the 1911 census, then. Uh, my great-grandfather, William Gilpin, he was listed as a watchman. And I will go on later to explain how I found out where he worked at the time. And um, we also then have another brother, my, my grandfather then, again, at that time listed as a joiner. So in the periods 1901 to 1911, he'd gone from being the apprentice to um, actually being a journeyman, <coughs> so having completed his apprenticeship. This is my other uh, grandfather. Um, he uh, was a shipwright, Harland and Wolf, and uh, he died now in uh, 1944. My father was only 17 when he died, but he was, um, that would have been a hard, difficult job, the shipwright work, um, out in all hours, um, but because it said shipwright, I knew he had to be working in one of the, the Belfast shipyards, and um, my, my granny, who actually lived until so her husband lived in until um, the early 90s and she never said anything about working clock. It was always hard and wolf, hard and wolf. Um, the apprenticeships then, they did generally start when they were about 14 or 15. So having got um, my grandfather's marriage, uh, my own father's birth certificate and then my grandfather's death certificate, shipwright is consistently listed throughout. 
Also, now uh, the street directories are an, a valuable source of information for finding out um, the occupations. And they do go back quite a, a number of years to the 1880s, 90s for the Belfast area. They are available um, free to look up on a Lennon Wiley website and uh, you can just browse down through the uh, list of um, directories. Also, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, based down on the Queen's Road, and the Linen Hall Library hold hard copies. Um, it can be quite tedious online going through uh, the details. But um, I was able then um, to learn more about my grandfather, Frederick Crothers, who was the shipwright, and a brother, David, who was a shipwright. There was only a year and a half between them. Um, they actually uh, came from Chambers Street in Donegal Pass, and uh, there were a family, there were 18 children born to the, to the great grandparents. Now, they didn't all survive into adulthood, but it was certainly a very large family. But newspapers are a great source of information, and the British newspaper archive, um, I have been able, uh, it's a subscription, so I, uh, I was able though to look up and put in key um, people's names, and I was able then to find different articles relating to um, the shipyard occupation. So I discovered my um, great uncle David listed as a shipwright in the Belfast Telegraph in 1942. He fell from staging on which he was working at Belfast docks. A shipyard worker, David Crothers of Broadway Parade, was um, received head injuries and was removed to the Royal Victoria Hospital. So there's two who were went to Harland and Wolf, worked in the same occupation. Their father was a saddler, so um, wasn't anything to do with the shipyard at the time. And I've just shown a, a photo there in the bottom right of an ad, which would have been a common tool used by the ship um, right um, men. Masonic Lodge records. I uh, don't know if any of you um, would know of your family's connections with Masonic Lodge. Um, I was able to find, um, this, these are again online, I got these through the Ancestry website and I, um, it's a, invaluable for, for the occupations that were listed there. At the very bottom it says Frederick W. Crothers and he was a shipwright. And there's, other, uh, there's another shipwright there, I see a driller, an iron moulder, a plater, um, an iron shipbuilder. So those are other shipyard occupations as well. So you, you'll get the name, um, the, the Union 106, I think that um, around Tate's Avenue now is where that was, uh, would have been based originally. And then some details when they joined the Masonic Lodge and then they'll maybe put if they were died or transferred or struck off, I've <laughs> come across that as well. So that's a great uh, source for looking to see if um, any of your relatives maybe had uh, been there. Um, service records. Now, we unfortunately, um, many of them were destroyed, but these are service records for 1914 to 1919. Again, I got those through the Ancestry website. Um, this is one which only has fragments of the document remaining, but it was a man who um, was able, I, it says over in the far right, Harland and Wolf Belfast, and uh, it stated that he was a plater's helper. So, um, a neat a plate layer. So, um, it's nice that, again, marries up with some of, um, maybe they, I did this for somebody who inquired about their relative. They hadn't been aware of them even working uh, during, being enlisting during the First World War. So, it was nice to be able, even those fragments, to get those details from it. And that's just a picture showing plate laying in 1899, working in all conditions for them. Um, this is a great uncle um, I discovered through my research then. Uh, Harndamove had its own fire brigade. There were often small fires that occurred, and mainly um, certainly at the end of the 19th century uh, with the timber yards, that was a frequent occurrence, and they used to have um, lookouts who were uh, day and night patrol drawing to make sure that if they caught sight of any fire, that they called on the fire engine. This is a picture of um, uh, some of the Harndon Wolf firemen. So my great uncle, uh, George Jennings, um, I was able, uh, although it just says fireman on his service record, I was able to find a letter that he, um, it, within his records, put later saying, 
can you give me a recommendation? I'm working for Harland and Wolf. I want to transfer to Whitley Street Fire Station. Harland and Wolf aren't paying me what I deserve to be paid, which I thought was lovely to actually yeah. read that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, he was looking for a transfer out. Um, <laughs> But uh, he, d he didn't get the transfer. Anyway. <laughs> you know, they kept hold of him. Um, and interestingly, there's a Harland and Wolf fire brigade uniform button, button at the bottom. Now, very sadly, um, my uncle George then, he actually, that's him in the bottom left, he joined, um, signed up as a fireman trimmer. And he was on a Harland and Wolf built vessel that was actually on its maiden voyage, uh, transferring coal. And uh, it was um, in October then of um, uh, 1917 that sadly uh, it was torpedoed and he lost his life. Um, he was one of um, six brothers, uh, so that was my, my grandmother's brothers, uh, who all enlisted during the Great War and he was the only one that sadly died. Um, that is a picture of the, the war clover top left and then it was actually camouflage. And that is the image that somebody has drawn of uh, how the war clover looked whenever it went out. So um, on the uh, Harland and Wolf Great War Memorial of 494 names, I have, along with a couple of other historians, um, identified almost all of those men. It has been very difficult because it just usually gives the initial and the surname, unlike the Workman Clark one, which I'll show you in a moment, which gives more detail. But every year on the 11th of November, there's a service held to um, mark the fact that these 494 men um, uh, perished who previously had worked in the shipyard. Um, it was, those three panels were originally featured on the outside of the headquarters, now the Titanic Hotel on the Queen's Road, and then were relocated after, sometime after 1989 to the um, uh, main uh, headquarters building now. Unfortunately, they won't allow you in to photograph them. You have to go through such a security um, uh, situation to get through. I managed to get in whenever um, they had their six weeks sit in. So that would have been August onwards of um, 2019. And uh, one of them, Robert Childs, I don't know if anyone knows him, chief electrician there, uh, was able to let me in because he said, now you can come on in, no one else cares, none of the management are here. So it was great getting a good walk around the shipyard and uh, especially to, to see um, the War Memorial with all those names on it. Um, yeah, this is just a photo then of uh, in the paper of um, the opening of the, the War Memorial that happened in uh, 1921. Um, Robert Childs has a website called theyardinfo.com and um, I've given him all the names, I've transcribed them all and slowly we're building up a record and hopefully putting links on them to each of the different men so that there'll be a biography. It's looking like, um, along with a great war historian, Nigel Henderson, and another man, a historian, Al Bodkin, um, working with the three of them, uh, two of them actually, along with then Robert, um, to identify all these men and probably put it in a book form if we can. Um, we have even identified others from newspapers that were not included on the memorial, so uh, it would be nice to, to include them too. Um, now, during the, oh, the, okay, yeah, this is the Wharton Clark Great War Memorial. It was originally on the North Yard, so the County Antrim side of the River Lagan, and uh, it was on their headquarters building. It was a beautiful um, sculpture, as you can see, and we are have only got the panels with the names on it. The rest of the relief, um, which was carved by um, Rosamund Prager, a Hollywood sculptress, um, we're not sure where they have gone. There's talk that it's actually in the Ulster Museum, but the Ulster Museum don't know the half of what they have, and we haven't uh, got to the bottom of it. There, um, so the Workman Clark descendant, David Lindsay of Ford Cars, if you remember years ago, um, he then became the second lieutenant of Down. He gave us that photo, and uh, we have identified of the 136 men's names, we've identified all but three, and I'll show you them in a moment. But on the War Memorial, it's got their full name or abbreviation, like JAS for James, and it's also got the battalion in which they would have uh, served. 
Um, that center uh, stone carving that you can see in the red st sandstone was actually Ted Workman, Edward Workman, who was um, Frank Workman's son. And I suspect that his death during the Great War was one of the reasons why the uh, Workman Clark shipyard ended up folding because there were no others to uh, take over the company business. It's just one of the reasons why that shipyard failed because there were a number of years, I've counted four years, where Workman Clark's tonnage exceeded um, Harndon Wolves. So they were not the wee yard as they were often known as. They weren't so wee. At one time they employed 20,000 people. So it's just in the Belfast sense compared to Harland and Wolf could they have been called the wee yard. So on the right is all the details. I can, anybody who would like me to give them a, a copy of that with all the, the men's names. And um, what we've done is where they came from, their age, um, maybe their parents and where they died and where else they maybe have been remembered in memorials. Along with the Ulster Scots Agency then, um, we petitioned to get a an information panel put up because the Workman Clark War Memorial is now on the side of the Thompson dry dock, uh, the, the pump house, sorry, um, which is beside the dry dock. It's been very badly weathered over the years. Unfortunately, they've put a perspex protective um, cover on it now, and now we've got information panels telling people exactly what this, um, you know, um, memorial actually is. It will get a lot more footfall in the coming days because the Titanic distillery is opening there at the beginning of April, I understand. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be people coming down. It'd be nice that they'll be able to pause and remember um, those shipyard workers. So many Belfast and other people have never even heard of Workman Clark and it's outside of most people's memories now. But there are a couple of uh, lovely survivors from that shipyard vessels that were built. There's one a beautiful 1885 bark in uh, Melbourne, Australia, being beautifully restored. And it is one of the, the key features in the, this particular um, museum. Uh, it's called the Polly Woodside now. Also, there's a monitor M33, if anyone's been to Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. Um, the Admiralty gave an order to Harland and Wolf to build five monitors. Harland and Wolf slipways were all filled at the time and they asked Workman Clark to take on two of them, um, the M33 and the M34 and the M33 has survived, it's been restored and it looks amazing so if you ever get a chance to go over there and um, have a look at it. So it's nice that there are a couple of examples of the, the wee yards um, workmanship still out there. Those are the men's names that we have not been able to identify, Joseph Breves, William Patrick or Robert Dye. I actually um, put out an appeal um, on the 100th anniversary of the unveiling of the memorial uh, through Radio Ulster. I was interviewed and um, still nobody has come forward um, with these names. We've tried all sorts of different variants. We've looked in England, we've even looked in America to see if they'd have been there. These three men remain a mystery. They were at one time important to Workman Clark to have been noted on their memorial. So if anyone can help, please do. <laughs> Now, for those men who didn't enlist and stayed and did the, um, the Admiralty's work for the, the war service, they uh, were given a badge and a card to carry around. Because could you imagine, you know, walking up Royal Avenue and a young fit lad being attacked by these older ones, hey, why are you not off working and supporting um, the war effort? And they could then produce these to say, oh, hold on a minute, I'm doing very important work for the war. And so that is an example of the on-war service badge that they would have held. And then um, we have an example from Harland and Wolf and Workman Clark of the two different cards. So, you know, if you've got any of these kind of things lying about in your drawers, um, it's amazing what people on earth, um, whenever you go through, uh, you, you know, your relatives, um, our uh, memorabilia. I'm currently clearing out my 96 year old um, father in law's house and I am coming across receipts and documents going back and, and he'd kept them from his parents' time. 
um, for Port Stewart where he had lived uh, going back to 1800s it's lovely seeing the mm. shop receipt for different uh, things that had been bought and I never even knew about them when he was alive we found them all up in the roof space <laughs> so you never know what you can find years later and uh, have a good focus they say around uh, your cupboards and it's possible you may even come across something like that so the other thing was in 1935 Harland Wolf photographed every single department in the shipyard um, I have got um, access to about I'll, I'll show you in a moment the different departments I have but it, it's lovely to, to see um, if you <coughs> knew that you, maybe your relative was in any one of these so crane drivers slingers with a pattern shop foundry core shop boiler shop and then the boiler shop two to ten shift drillers riveters from both east yards engine works fitting shop engine works smiths tools room stages in the main yard and turners and machine men north works so those are all the um photographs that people have actually given me with their relatives in it or uh, i've seen them online and then asked permission from the owners so um I'm happy if anyone want, knows of their relatives that maybe worked around 1935 in Harland and um, that you'd like me to send you a copy more than happy can, through Johnny then I'm happy to, to, to do that. Now, as I mentioned the newspapers, they have been a valuable source of um, information for me. I'm sorry that some of those haven't reproduced very well, they're a bit blurry. Uh, these are just some examples I've got. So, um, that, that first left one uh, was an obituary for uh, Chief Shipyard Draftsman, um, Samuel Joseph uh, Connolly. Interestingly, he was a Catholic employee. Roughly 90% um, were Protestant and 10% Catholic uh, around the, the beginning of the century. Um, but this man, uh, Samuel Joseph Donnelly, um, who died, uh, it mentions then at the bottom Gilbert Donnelly who is also on the drawing office staff so there you've got confirmation of another relative it was actually his brother um, we've got um, Belfast Telegraph insert from 1959 a Joseph McKee who died but you get then um, the Harland and Wolf foreman and workers of Harland and Wolf um, Abercorn Works who put in a notice for their colleague um, then 9, 10th of June 1911, Mrs. Dobbin, she was the wife of um, James Dobbin who was killed the day after Titanic's launch and um, she put in um, a note of thanks to the shipwrights of Messrs. Harland and Wolf. Um, just on a, on a side note about James Dobbin, he has been listed on a plaque that sits on D Street of, as one of the men who died during um, Titan's construction. It was through research I discovered that he died the day after Titanic was launched in that um, he was removing all the shoring um, and from and staging when he was hit on the head with one of them and uh, that was on the 1st of June and I think then he did die the, the, the day after. Um, so he didn't die at launch. You may have uh, heard this story elsewhere. And lots of stories have changed over time. Um, one recent one in a few, within the past few years is um, Samuel Joseph Scott, who was a 15 year old boy who was supposedly Titanic's first victim, um, a stager who fell uh, to his death. And through meticulous uh, research with a lady, Jeanette Lung, from the East Side Partnership, um, it was discovered that it was probably her brother. It was a switch because that Samuel Joseph Scott went on to lead a full life, emigrated to Canada, came back and is buried in um, Milltown Cemetery. Uh, his brother was two years younger, should not have been employed at Harndon Wolf and um, it's possible when the mother Jane Scott went to identify supposedly Samuel and saw George rather than get him in trouble or whether Harndon Wolf fluffed it over, we don't know. But um, in 1901, George Scott is in the census, George Scott disappears. He's not, um, he's not even in the, the 1911 census, or he is, sorry, he isn't. And then um, the family said there was no record ever of George ever again. So we believe that that is George, a 13-year-old, lying in that grave. He maybe went along to help 
his, his brother who was on the stage and part of a riveting uh, gang. So even over 100 years later, history is being rewritten and um, going back to the root sources to get information um, and get inquest reports uh, can often then put a different story onto things. Um, I've included the, uh, the far right one, it's just a couple of examples, I'm sorry that's quite a small one, and um, those are death notices for William Neal, who was killed on Queen's Island on the 2nd of April 1916, and then um, Truesdale that accidentally drowned at Queen's Island Albert. Researching Albert Truesdale, I discovered he was actually um, an apprentice with Workman Clark, but he had gone over to the county downside, probably either that or he was working in the South Yard, and he went to witness the launch of a vessel, and sadly he, he, he fell into the water and drowned, and it was weeks before his body was actually retrieved. But it's, it's death notices, obituaries, thank yous, in memoriam, uh, notices that you can see then evidence of shipyard employment and I found this only mm, a couple of years ago so my great-grandfather who was a, a sea captain um, and on the 1911 census was recorded as a watchman it was when I uh, got his obituary 5th of December 1914 where it says some four years ago he obtained a position in employment of Messrs Harland and Wolfe. So he actually worked for Harland and Wolfe during the period from 1910 to 1914, whenever uh, the Olympic class vessels, um, so Olympic, uh, Titanic and Brit Britannic were being uh, built. So he was essentially like a security man and um, it was due to ill health. He had been at sea uh, from he was a young lad and um, being a captain sailed all over the world on board the old type of sailing vessels. He originally had been from Killock in County Down, moved to Belfast and worked on the um, coal vessels going in and out to Murray Port, etc. And my own mother remembered uh, her grandmother uh, talking about going with the father on some of his journeys. But it was only um, seeing the watchman in 1911, I thought, well, where was he doing security work? It was only because of his obituary. You know, it's not that large, but it gave me the information I needed that he'd been there four years in Harland and Wolf. And his uh, son, who was also working there, my, my grandfather. So it's nice being able to tie things up like that. So I cannot, uh, you know, overestimate your say uh, just how much information you can get from newspapers is fantastic. Yeah, the newspaper library in Belfast, um, right beside the, the central library, um, you're able to get hard copies as well as on microfilm as well, and that's all free to the public. If you don't want to take out a subscription to British Newspaper Archive, they have the uh, newsletters going back from the late 1700s. So it's, it's amazing to see and looking at adverts and uh, everything. It just builds up a lovely social history picture of uh, the area and that there's plenty of Shankill uh, mentioned in all the newspapers. So yeah, definitely a big, great project for, for people to do. Um, so the Public Record Office of uh, Northern Ireland there in the Queen's uh, Road, uh, they have a number of inquest records uh, relating to deaths that would have occurred at the shipyard. Um, sadly, they were very common, especially um, the late 1800s and the early part of the 19th, uh, the 20th century. Um, so uh, I've been able to get some of these out. You can go in person and request these documents and um, I've, I've seen some of them. So when you're doing a search, you can go and search on uh, Crony's website, the e-catalogue, and uh, just put in some names and uh, so you, you can be lucky and get some hits and these were two that I was doing uh, research for somebody who'd asked me about their relative uh, Thomas Thompson, Queen's Island again um, obviously Harland and Wolfe that was so that was 1885 and then um, another man Henry White who died at Harland and Wolfe some of the men you know you get the inquest and it may have been a heart attack so it wasn't always um, accidents that happened but um, that is another great source that I have uh, used. Um, 
Going back then again, yes, to newspapers, we've got accident reports, compensation, inquest claims. Some of them go into great detail, and I love the in inquest reports because they bring in witnesses, so who may have worked with the individual that day. There'll be names, there'll be names of uh, the foreman who's in charge. So it, it's just lovely getting all the, the different names. Now, the, that uh, top left there, we have an apprentice shipwright, Robert <coughs> McQuillan, 18, uh, who was employed by Workman Clark, he died um, sadly after a severe fall. James Barr, he was an apprentice riveter at Workman Clark and he uh, had a fracture of the arm falling from a lower deck onto um, a tank top. And then Thomas Newell from Templemore Street, he was employed into Queen's Island. He had shock and, and contusion or head injury caused by a fall. And then the um, the Belfast shipyard workers killed, and we have um, a, an inquest. So it was a man, Samuel Spence, 49, and who was a fireman in Workman Clark. And it actually mentions the vessel that he was working on, so number uh, 325. And there's a, a book written by John Lynch called Belfast Built Ships, and it gives details of all the yard numbers and the, the, the ship's name beside it. So uh, it was nice being able to um, tell this family when I was doing research into Samuel Spence how he had died and also I, I found a photo of the vessel that he was working on whenever he had that accident and that's, that's quite meaningful for people whenever they, they can tie all this up together. They've got the occupation, he was a fireman, they know where he worked now and they know the ship that he worked on and they also know those individuals who were um, were with him at the time, so the apprentice that was there with him was William Childs, and that actually is, I think, the great-great-grandfather of Robert Childs, a current employee of Harland and Wolf. He hadn't been aware that his great-great-grandfather had worked in um, Workman Clark, so there was evidence, because he, but he'd remembered him coming then to Harland and Wolf. So, yeah, the men did move between the, the shipyards, depending on what uh, work was available at the time. And um, then we've even got mention of the foreman that was at the job, Robert Hamilton. So you've got, you've got these men's names, you've got a ship number and you've got the, the shipyard, which is great then for building up a bigger story. Um, then uh, this is an original um, compensation that was um, awarded to um, this man, uh, Dave Thompson. He, he gave me a, it just... Uh, what was it? Oh, Jane Thompson, so yes, because her husband had died and they were providing um, finance for her and for the children. So it's nice to have even original documents like that because it gives the details of the person and uh, where they worked, etc. Um, what have we got next? Would you believe some headstones uh, I've come across in the various um, cemeteries around the country. So we've got, uh, this one is actually out in Corn Money, and then we've got Belfast City Cemetery, and even Roselawn, I've seen a couple where it's mentioned, Harland and Wolf or Workman Clark. Uh, this sad case uh, involved um, a, a young man who was killed in the Workman Clark shipyard, and uh, his wife and young child had, had died the previous uh, year. Uh, he was a Plater's helper. But it was actually the Monkstown Weaving Company who their employee was the father of this young man. And they obviously really felt that there was no money to erect a headstone. So they all got together and uh, uh, were able to uh, erect this nice headstone in memory of um, William Thompson who'd, who perished when he uh, fell. So uh, I've, seen, I, I should, I've got a couple of others as well where it's, it mentions Harland and Wolf and the department where he worked and they have maybe clubbed together and got the, the headstone because the family, as my, as my mum said, half of my relatives up in uh, the Belfast City Cemetery have no um, headstone. She said, well, no, we needed the, the, the money for food and uh, rent. Uh, you wouldn't have erected a headstone. The dead are dead. We know where they were but uh, it didn't provide for the living and that was more important. Another good uh, source I've come across are the Prony Will calendars. And um, again, so I'd mentioned earlier about Samuel James Donnelly and he is a uh, chief uh, ship draftsman. Uh, the next example, a foreman brass molder uh, mentioned that he worked, uh, he died 
at um, Harland and Wolf, he actually died um, that month, I think, from a heart attack. It wasn't as a result of an accident. And then we've, um, again, that lower person then, William Somerville, Plater's helper, and he also died then at the shipyard that time, Workman Clark. So um, it's, it's good if you want, you can search for wills online um, on the Prony website, and then you can actually go in and request copies of uh, the wills and um, there may not be an awful lot of information some of them have very little but it's it's nice that here we have another um, source given um, the occupation and where they were working at the time when they died now indenture rec records um, apprenticeship records are something that probably many families did hold on to um, I have seen my grandfather's, uh, it's gone to uh, another family member now in England, but um, that obviously then is um, a great source for um, proving that your relative worked in either Har Harlandham Wolf or Workman Clark. This is the earliest one that I have ever come across and it's actually held by Prony. Um, and uh, I can't remember the name of that. Who's that? What was he doing? John Coburn, and it gives his address, and uh, he was going to be a, a shipwright, and it was for the period of five years. And signed by Harland and Wolf um, at the bottom there. Whoops, no, that's not maybe working well. Um, yes, and I just thought I would include a photograph about the shipwrights uh, at work. Um, that was a dirty, dangerous work on the, on the vessels in all weather conditions. Um, this is another nice example of an apprenticeship certificate and uh, what's nice is we've got a picture and it's either one of these two boys and the, the person who owned it said they didn't know which was their grandfather. But um, so the um, apprenticeship records will look different and they have changed over the years. But he was going to serve seven years to become a sailmaker. And uh, this is a, a sewing uh, machine that was actually on display as part of an exhibition a few years ago. A uh, massive uh, sewing machine that they reckon was used for making the sales. So if you come across an apprenticeship uh, certificate and denture record, that um, certainly will be very useful in identifying um, the individual. Um, did research for this family, um, Esther E. Pritchard, um, uh, and that's a, her grandfather, I believe, and she came along with his certificate and he became a plater. And it's just nice then getting his marriage certificate in the top right showing a plater. The um, bottom right is the uh, uh, census for 1911 and it actually shows him um, listed as an iron shipbuilder. So plater, iron shipbuilder, they could be um, crossover. And in his family, three brothers and the father all worked in the shipyard as um, iron uh, shipbuilders or platers. These are just some examples that we actually um, were able to get by auction in England. As the society, we were alerted to the fact that there'd been um, bundles of um, papers. How they got over to England, I don't know. Um, but it, it's nice that we have um, some apprenticeship records um, and dentures from 19... Uh, 59 to, through to 1966. Um, we have been told though that we cannot just um, digitize these and put these online because it's outside the 100 year rule and uh, we don't want to be prosecuted. But if anybody privately wanted to um, get in touch with me, I'm happy to look through them and I'm putting them all in a database at the moment. So if we do get inquiries from individuals uh, that we can verify them, we're happy to let them have a copy of the indenture record. So whenever they apply to be an apprentice, um, it's that uh, left hand one there is, uh, he was going to uh, be applying to be a turner. Um, the dates given there, that's 18, 1935, sorry, uh, his full name, his address, and his date of birth, and the current or guardian signed at the bottom. So the apprenticeship, um, around Titanic's time now, the, the five-year apprenticeship would have been um, five pounds paid um, by the parents or guardian, and which was a massive amount of money um, for a lot of those parents. And if they, uh, the individual um, successfully completed their apprenticeship, then the five pounds was returned. Now, if there were a lot of uh, 
day sick or um, bad behaviour, that money was not returned back. So uh, you wouldn't have liked to have had your parents wrath if you didn't get your, your money back. The premium apprenticeships um, were th usually those from middle class backgrounds. So the likes of um, uh, William Perry, etc., and Thomas Andrews, they, their families paid £100, which was non-refundable. They did the same um, kind of, uh, you know, apprenticeship, uh, but they would have been more or less guaranteed a senior position once they finished. So they would have maybe become a foreman, or then eventually gone to, on to become managing directors. And um, so they were they were the premium ones. Um, we do also have within our, the Belfast Titanic Society collection um, a number of. Um, Working Clark apprenticeship letters um, that were transferred over to Holland and Wolf when uh, Working Clark went out of business. So they, uh, so if they've maybe already completed two years of their apprenticeship, this was to be allowed whenever they were doing the transfer over. And these letters are given the the, the names of the individuals who were were moving to Holland and Wolf. Also, there's some loose leaf um, apprenticeship uh, lists these have um, just been from 1914 to 1935 so if anybody uh, thinks one of their relatives may have been um, a boiler maker or machinist or fitter they can certainly get in touch with it with me and i can look down the list to see if uh, the particular name is there um, it would have given the, the name it's given uh, when they started their apprenticeship and any other notes Sadly, there's a couple of occasions where it says that they have maybe um, died during the Great War period or died from other causes or died as a result of an accident. Some just left, they didn't like the work or whatever. And um, it, it, this is another <coughs> source to have as well. Again, we have some wages um, ledgers for the various um, occupations. We've got... Um, We've got an iron dresser there, iron molder, and it's you know it's great just having the, the extra names there, and um, various occupations. So again, please do get in touch. Um, the municipal technical college that was located beside Ince, um, they also then have records in Prony of Holland and Wolf apprentices for 1913 to 14, and uh, they would have gone there um, as a day release for <coughs> evening classes. Um, so you can go and uh, view these documents yourself, and uh, yeah, you just have to painstakingly go down through the names to see if you get any hits for any of your your relatives. Again, held by Prony, um, our college records then for other apprentices from 1928 to 29. Um, and uh, there are letters as well, and there's some really interesting ones um, where some of them, I came across a letter were sent to her and was saying, look, can you let these um, men out sooner to go to, to their classes because they're arriving late and they're disturbing everyone. So it's nice just seeing uh, and, and the, the five or six men's names that then are listed. Um, another prony um, document is uh, apprentices who served between 1887 to 1894. And there's quite a lot of detail given for each of these individuals where you've got the name, where they came from, their age, and um, who paid the five pound uh, amount. And we've got an R. Uh, it doesn't show there's an R at the very bottom which would have been a refund so that's the five pound deposit refunded back to the, the parents of them but it's good to get the um, the name, the date of birth, the occupation and their address and also the father um, who signed for them. The birds or the time birds so um, these are what the uh, men would have uh, used these were used right until uh, the early 70s, even maybe later, I'm not sure. Um, and they had numbers stamped at the bottom and that denoted uh, your individual number. You pick these up from the, the time office on your way into um, work. And then if you were, if you to go to another department, maybe to borrow a tool, you were expected to hand your board in and then collect it again. Also, if you needed to go to the toilet, uh, you were allocated seven minutes, I believe. They were known um, as the minutes. And uh, so you had to hand, the <coughs> and then at going home time, they had to be handed in. That was to calculate your, your wages. 
Now there were some rascals in uh, in the, the yards, and uh, they were no. oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you would have got um, some lad going home at uh, tea time, uh, knocking off time with about five or six in his hand, and they'd have just thrown them through the hatch of the time office because some of his mates had said, "Could you um, throw our board?" And they'd have skived off maybe to go to the bookies or the pub or whatever. You know, and it's like the joke: um, how many people worked in the shipyard? And the answer would be ah, about half of them. You know, so. Um, but yeah, these. Um, these are, are, are actually cool to have it. And you can actually buy one yourself. They're still available. There's a website, Belfast Maritime Collectibles. They charge them £25. But if you want a piece of that, it's, it's just rubber wood with the, the numbers on the end. But that was your unique number. And most shipyard men knew their number off by heart. And they probably, you can all, if you had them, remember them to this day. We then had <coughs> classes that were introduced from the 1974s onwards. Um, not everybody was apparently wanting to change to them. It was a bit like apparently when the hard hats came in. You'd have got the likes of the old boys who would have had their dunchers. And um, oh, weren't the hard hats, so they put the hard hat on top of their dunchy, you know? So, uh, yeah, difficult to change, isn't it? No one likes change. But these were the passes. Now, these are other things that have cropped up in people's cupboards and amongst their family mem memorabilia that have sent uh, to me so that uh, another proof of evidence of um, shipyard employment. So we've got the Harland and Wolf Employees Social and Recreation Club, we've got a Boilermakers Shipbuilders Society, we've got wages slips, um, that's a war permit. So different things in which it mentions Harland and Wolf or you know Workman Clark if that was the case. So again, another uh, great source if you can find any of these little documents. Um, this was a, a recent um, uh, source that came to light actually during uh, COVID. I haven't gone to look at them yet. That bottom image, um, a man called John or Jack Chambers, he was a former union rep a manager in the drawing office at Harndon Wolf, and he actually has union cards from the 1916 period up to the 1970s. I said to him, well, you're not made to give those back. He says, no, I was the union rep and nobody told me, so he says, I've got them here. So he, he lives around Dromore area, so I must pay him a visit sometime and have a look at all of those, and um, that would be invaluable as well. I'm not sure how many are held. That was just one box uh, he showed me. And that's just an example on the right, that's the, the drawing office, which is now, um, that one itself is the main function room. So if anybody was going to be going to a dinner or, or that in the hotel, uh, stripped of all those desks, but it's a beautiful room. Now, Prony have, they, they have a lot of uh, and Wolf documentation, but they're in boxes and boxes, crates and crates of them. And they have been stored um, in, on Queen's Island. They've now been all transferred to the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. And they themselves are slowly working their way through different plans, different records. Um, it's lack of uh, uh, manpower to, to do a lot of it. Um, but it's hoped then in future that they'll be able to um, give us access to more records. They will be mainly about the ships that were built. So they've got a lot of the. The, the, the drawing plans, the rigging plans, etc. But this was just an example I came across in Prony. Nice to, to think that they had a souvenir book um, that was printed covering the period 1928 to 29. And there's lots of names within that booklet um, relating to the different societies that uh, were in Queen's Island. And who knew they had an opera? society my word that, that one got me and the ladies hockey club so yeah quite interesting they actually had their own boy scouts uh, group so um, yeah and the male voice choir which uh, is uh, still going um, again I, th this was just an example I wanted to include to marry different items up this is a book that has been written um, by the, the granddaughter of a man called um, William Kelly, who actually was imprisoned for um, the manslaughter or death of his wife. And there's a quite detailed um, newspaper accounts of the inquest. 
and um, he's buried in that grave and they, they got a, the family got a headstone erected not too long ago and um, he's in actually with his wife so uh, the family um, were not convinced it was him that his wife apparently was fond of the drink and uh, um, the family believe that she herself fell down the stairs rather than being pushed by her husband but the reason why I'm including this shipwright, and that's a book that has been written loosely based on his life story, is because on the Lennon Wiley website, there was a petition signed in 1912 and again in 1915 by his fellow um, employees uh, requesting the release of him. So the, the 1912 one is great. It's actually got the, um, the person's name who signed it. So these have all been transcribed. And um, there's a whole list of names, um, about a hundred or more, uh, given their name, their um, address, and if they worked in the shipyard, their occupation. And the same on the right hand side, only no address that time, just the name and occupation if they worked in the shipyard. So I, I've, I've looked down those and I have found for some people um, evidence of their shipyard worker. I'd say, oh yes, your, 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 your relative John White was a corker, did he live at uh, 24 Shankill Road or whatever? And then um, we've, uh, they've come back and they've had the information that proved it. And I said, right, well, they actually signed this form requesting the release of um, their, their fellow employee from prison. He was given early release because he did um, suffer bad health and, and died within months of being released from prison. But that was a few years after these were um, uh, were signed. But I, I know it doesn't sound much, but it's great that you, you get lots of different sources. You can put them all together, and it just confirms and marries up um, what some stories people have just heard from their relatives, that they worked in Harland and Wolf, and they haven't known any more than that. These are crony uh, documents. So these are what um, William Perry decided should be kept. So these are the staff wages books, not the not the, the humble uh, laborer or um, joiner or shipwright, but these are the ones relating to um, the um, drawing office staff. So you've got the draftsmen, the naval architects, you've got engineers, you've got the secretaries and um, other foremen. So um, you have to go, uh, the crony, you can go and view these on site and um, have a look down through them and it gives the, their name or their initial and their surname uh, maybe the year they started and it gives their pay which is a nice um, entry because then you can then uh, cross-reference maybe later ledgers they may not appear in and then they may have come back so sometimes they may have been some of the, the senior personnel may have been sent over to Liverpool or Southampton or to the Clyde to help start off uh, to start business, the, the Harlem Wolf business over there and then they come back again so it's nice to be able to fill those gaps in with the, the wages ledgers and what the family already know. Uh, these are the drawing office uh, wages 1881 to 1907. Again, uh, that's um, you just have to go through it meticulously and uh, see if you get any hits. Um, we've got electrical department uh, apprenticeships. This was one of the ledgers that was rescued from a skip in 1989 whenever uh, a lot of the documents were being turfed out and it is in a private collection. The individual I have approached on a couple of occasions but strangely won't, isn't happy to share um, which is sad because um, you know I don't know why he's holding on to it whenever we could maybe be accessing information for other people um, but maybe he'll change his mind in the future but there we go. Um, we have actually, this is in a private collection, it's Harland and Wolf Record of Fines book. So if your ancestor was a bit of a rascal and uh, got up to no good, like boiling the can too early, um, bad timekeeping, what else, we've got smoking, um, leaving without um, permission, um, smoking, boiling the can seems to be a, a, a frequent one. But the, the, the green area that I've highlighted is a John Henry who was fined a quarter of a day's pay on the 9th of December 1910, dropping links from gangway number 401. 401 is Titanic's um, yard number. So there is just one example, there's very, very few. 
one example of um, somebody who definitely worked on Titanic's construction because uh, it was while he was there he dropped these links and um, clearly wasn't being careful and he was fined a day's pay. And in the right hand column, that was usually the foreman who um, would have authorised that um, fine. So it's, it's nice coming across again um, more evidence of uh, the individual. And also the third column from the left is um, the individual's unique um, number board, so his time board. So that's nice to have that. Um, we've also uh, scanned pages, again, from a private uh, collection, and the person's happy for us to use these. It's from a drawing office book this individual kept, and it was um, passed on whenever he left to other individual. And it's talking about, there's the likes of the engine works, it's talking about the vessels that were maybe built, individuals that left, um, and new people that started. So there's names there um, that, you know, are, are great then to have as another source. Yes, so the shipyard did actually have female employees. Um, one of my relatives uh, worked in the canteen in Workman Clark, and she actually met her husband, who was a boiler maker, uh, in the shipyard. And uh, so different occupations. The tracers were predominantly female. Upholsters, curtain makers, dining room staffs, typist secretaries, telephonists, uh, nurses, and a comptometer operator. Um, so there have been a series of women over the years who've worked in the yard. And top right is a, a secretary, Charlotte Brennan, who actually, um, that's her stop of her ticket. She um, went to Titanic's launch on 31st of May 1911. <coughs> so um, it's nice then that we have a photo as well to, to go along with uh, that lovely, unique um, uh, part of her history. Another source kept guarded by Harland and Wolf and um, not released to, to the public, except when it, it's been on display a couple of times. It was last year in the, the hotel put on display and then a couple of years prior to that. And um, uh, William Perry, who's seen on the left of that photo stand and pardon me, alongside Edward Smith, the uh, Titanic's captain. And uh, to mark uh, Lord Perry um, being made a Viscount, uh, in 1921, uh, contributions were given by employees to make a beautiful illustrated, uh, illuminated book. And inside that book are hundreds <coughs> of names. And so I'm hoping um, in due course that Arnold and Wolf would see a uh, good reason that we could actually get a um, scan in the, the names and then they could be put in a, a database so that you know, in future we could maybe say, yes, your um, relative worked in Harland and Wolf in 1920 to 21. So it's just again another source um, of uh, employee records. Um, it's just a shame, as I say, that we're not at present being allowed to um, view them. Interestingly, uh, the Belfast Charitable Society Clifton Street Poorhouse, um, they actually sent some of their um, the, the children that were there to various places to do um, their apprenticeships. So they'd have been sent to mills, that have been sent to other factories, but they also sent them to the shipyards to train and uh, they actually have the apprenticeship records. I've yet to go and see them, and um, but I understand they're from the very early period. So you're talking maybe 1870s, 1880s, but it is um, another source that just popped up during the lockdown period that I haven't been aware of. So it will give their name and it will say what they have actually gone to do. Um, shipbuilding is what is mentioned on one of those uh, boys' forms. Nearing the end, you'll be glad to hear. So doing my own research, I discovered then, um, this is an iconic photo, the going home in roughly May 1911, and how you know that is uh, there's Titanic in the Arrow Gantry being built. Uh, you can just about see um, the by there of Nomadic in the Hamilton Dock where she's back located now, and uh, then what was called by the workmen as the White House. It was built around 1864, I think, and it was actually built for the deputy harbour masters and um, there were two houses and in the middle was an office space. And it was through doing my own family tree research that I actually discovered um, that the William Gilpin, my great grandfather, who um, 
that saw that you saw was the watchman. Um, it was his brother, John Henry Gilpin, who actually lived there as a deputy harbour master. So I was able to find um, that there were other occupants uh, living along the Queen's Road. There were a couple of houses because people said, did anyone ever live on site? Well, yes, we can prove from the 1901-1911 census there were. And um, that was the 19... Um, no, 18, oh, 1932, that can't be right. That I found then the Queen's Road, we've got the Abercorn Basin, we've got a bookkeeper lived in one of the houses, and then my great, great uncle, um, Deputy Harbour Master. And uh, we've got Workman Clark listed there uh, at South Yard. And um, yes, I just then went on to look up uh, death notice and um, access uh, the, the death uh, details for for my great great uncle so um he was actually deputy harbour master at the time then and uh it's nice then just to be able to build up a story around a picture i hadn't known that until a few years ago when i and it's only through doing the, the research i discovered that there are then some facebook groups um many of you may know these already there's a few the, the shipyard run by um Shipyard uh, workers and working clerk in the Great War and SS Harland and Wolf. Um, you, you do get past employees then, right? And then we've also got um, two websites. So within the past year, we've set up a website called the Belfast Shipyard, and that is actually for working clerk because um, working clerk they uh, they said we are the Belfast Shipyard and Engineers. So it was they themselves said that. I'm not sure if. Uh, Harland and Wolf were very impressed by that, but um, the Yard Info is the other website um, that would be uh, devoted to um, doing more about the uh, shipyard. So the Workman Clark one that has been set up really primarily is focused on the 1914 to 1919 period, and because that's it was done off the back of the research that we had been doing for the Workman Clark um, War <coughs> Memorial. So as you can see. You, you could, I started out thinking, no, there's no sources available for shipyard workers. But it's surprising with just a bit of um, uh, research, and I've got, I, I don't let things go. I like to go back to the, the, the root source to get information, and um, I, I find myself going off on a tangent and saying, I wonder if would anything down this end. So a bit of detective-like qualities. Um, my father was a policeman, so that may be part <laughs> of it. And... Um, so uh, it, it's getting the sources that you've been told within the family. So if the family's been told, yep, we definitely had people that worked in the shipyard. And I was just talking to, uh, to a friend and he was telling me that his family come from Keswick Street and that, um, yes, his father definitely worked in the shipyard and I discovered him being a labourer. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly where he was, but it's nice um, that you're that you're able then to marry up family stories. And then if you've got any documentation, you've got you know, children's birth certificates and it actually mentions um, the father's occupation, then you can assume that they work in the shipyard. Now, if it's after 1935, it's definitely Harland and Wolf. Prior to that, it can be one of the two shipyards. So, you'll be glad to hear that's the end. Thank you very much, Maureen.